dwelling life. So it's been like a, we've had a huge break on that. So, but this is going to be session 15, Enabling Grace, and um, probably going to spend, we're, we are going to spend two weeks on teaching about God's grace. It's a huge topic, very, very important that we understand what God's grace is. And so I just want to start off by uh, just sharing th this, what's been on my heart. I don't, know, I don't know if you have seen the documentary Shiny Happy People on Amazon Prime. Raise your hand if you've seen that. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Um, I, I would recommend you watch it if you haven't seen it. It's about the Duggars, the 19 or 20 kids and counting. And, and, and basically this documentary goes through, and I'll just summarize it like this. It, it really shows what it's like when New Testament Christians live like Old Covenant Jews. And it, it really is basically Christian legalism. And, and just watching it was breaking my heart, just, just seeing like these, these kids and those who had been raised in this kind of a legal, Christian legalistic indoctrination, just seeing that they're being, they're, they're being raised and groomed to think that God is like this. And I just wanted to scream through the TV, God is not like this. You know, I wanted to say, get my book and dwelling life. But, you know, but God is not like that. You know, God is a God of life. God is a God of relationship. God is not a God of just, you know, yes, the Lord gives principles and yes, the Lord gives guidance and commandments and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, that's not what this thing's about. It's about a relationship with Christ. And so even, even as we did baptism today, just like, it just really just stirred my heart that we're raising our children up to be a people that are not following rigid requirements. Now, there is a place, of course, to, to is a balance in this, because you don't just give them total free reign to do whatever they want, and we're not saying that, but there's a, this balance that we want to make sure that we're leading them to a person, not to a tablets of stone. We're leading them to a person, not to tablets of stone. We're leading them into an internal relationship with Jesus Christ that's filled with life. And so it just renewed that, just watching that, just kind of rekindled afresh my burden that, that the, the importance of this teaching of learning to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ is so, so important. It's so important. And so if you have your Bibles, let's turn to John chapter 15, verse 10. I want to start off with just reading a couple scriptures here just to help us get in, 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 uh, in gear with where we're going here. Is the abiding life, I said this in the last, the last session I did on the indwelling life, the abiding life hinges on obedience. The abiding life hinges on obedience. But it's not a, an obedience of robotic compliance it's an obedience of love. If you love me, you will obey me. We don't obey the Lord to prove our love for him. We obey the Lord because we are in love with him and we can't help but obey him. And so Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 10, he said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Notice the condition. Obedience leads to abiding, is it is impossible to live the abiding life without obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Obedience is absolutely vital. Yet here's what we love, I love about the new, the new covenant. Is the new, in the new covenant, the Lord doesn't just say, okay, here, like it is in the old covenant, here's a set of commandments you must keep. Because remember in the earlier session, we talked about the law. The law said, I, the Lord said, you, or the law said, you must, you shall, you must, you shall. And all the emphasis was upon the people to keep the God's commandments. And it was impossible because they didn't have the nature to keep God's commandments. Yet in the new covenant, what we see in Ezekiel 36 is we see in Jeremiah 31, we see the Lord coming and saying, instead of saying, you shall, the Lord says, I will, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. 
I will put my spirit within you. I will cleanse you from your, un, your, your uncleanness and your filthiness. I will do, the Lord says, I will do 11 things for you and in you. Before he says, here's the requirement you must do to keep my requirements. See, the new covenant, the, dif the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, the old covenant was all about you shall, you must the burden was resting upon you to obey God in your own strength and power. In the new covenant, God says, I will, and he gives you the power inside to live up to his holy standard. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and now let's turn to John, John chapter 1, verse 17. And I'm going to read this from the New King James Version just because I think it flows a little bit easier. But... This is, again, John stressing to us the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And John says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That is beautiful. The law came through Moses. Listen. But Jesus Christ brought to us grace and truth. See, the law was only about truth with no grace. There was no power. There was no enablement. There was no ability for the, the Israelites to keep God's commandments because God did not dwell in them. But in the new covenant, Jesus Christ comes and he brings truth and he brings grace. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, if you think about it, the external commandments were all about, uh, all, all, everything about the external commandments was the truth without grace. And even though these commandments were spiritual, holy, and righteous, these commandments had no power to make you spiritual, holy, and righteous. All they could do is point out to you the weakness and the depravity of your flesh. They're still, though, spiritual, holy, and righteous because that's exactly what Paul said. But all it is is like a mirror looking, where you look in a mirror and you see your flaws, but these commandments have no power to change you. It's like a 500-pound person who needs to lose weight stepping on the scale and the law says, you weigh 500 pounds, you need to lose 200 pounds. And the person who weighs 500 pounds says, I can't do it because all the law can do is say to you, this is what you must do, but it gives you no power to make any change. But grace comes along and says, you weigh 500 pounds, you need to lose 200 pounds. I am going to change your desire so that you will love exercise and eating healthy and you will not want to just sit around and watch TV all day. Grace is the power of God that works inside of you to change you. Thank God for his incredible grace. Francis Frangipan, in his book, Holiness, Truth, and the Presence of God, just made a, a classic statement that I, I love this statement. I'm going to read it here. We'll show it up there as well. But it, it, this is so important as it relates to us being made ready as a bride, as it relates to us being the people God wants us to be. This is so important. He said, if you hear a teaching and feel as though it was unattainable in your condition, you have only heard half the message. Raise your hand if you've ever felt that way. Okay, all of us have felt that way. All of us have felt, okay, this is unattainable. I am an absolute wreck. I am an absolute mess. I agree with what they're saying, but in my condition, I can't do it. And he goes on to say, here's what, here's what's so important. You miss the grace that is always resident in the heart of God's truth. Always. Jesus Christ came and he brought truth and he brought grace. If all you hear is the truth, you miss out on the other half of what he brings and that's grace. Within every commandment he gives, there's always the grace to keep it. That's what's so awesome about him. Truth without grace is only half true. Just let that sink in for a second. 
truth without grace is only half true. Remember this always. Grace and truth are realized in Jesus Christ. Now, I highlighted this last statement. What God's truth demands, his grace will provide. I want to give you confidence. I want to give you confidence in the grace of God. You know, we have been teaching for over 20 years the need for the church to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ. We have been teaching over and over and over the, the, the requirement God is calling us to, to be overcomers. And I know, I know as we have taught that, as I have taught that, I know a lot of times people feel as if I can never do it and they disqualify themselves immediately and say, I will never ever be able to live up to that standard that God's calling me to. And it brings them under guilt and condemnation and defeat. That standard does not, God does not lower that standard. God gives you grace to lift you up to God's standard so you can obey the standard he's looking for to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ. So anytime you hear a message that's challenging, anytime you hear a message that you feel as if in your condition I can't do it, I am never going to be able to do it, always, always, Always remember this, God's grace gives you the power to obey and to live up to his truth. I'm I'm right now in in the process of studying and preparing to write another book on eternal rewards. And that message is challenging. That message is challenging. I mean, just to think, Paul said, at the, you know, Paul said, I run in such a way, not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I buffet my body so that after I preach to others, I would not be disqualified from the prize of eternal rewards that God offers. That's Paul saying that. It's like, whoa, that's challenging. At the end of his life, Paul was saying that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and being conformed to his death, that somehow I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, the out resurrection. Paul was saying that. that. I'm telling you, these eternal rewards, they are very challenging. And so I'm even setting you up for when I'm teaching that, however long it is down in the future when, I, when we teach that, it is going to challenge you to the core. That's why I want you to just get this foundation in your heart and don't ever, ever forget it, is whatever God's truth demands, His grace provides. And we'll talk about what does that mean. Grace is the power of God. Grace is the power of God that works inside of you so that you can be who God's called you to be and you can do what God has called you to do. God's grace is sufficient to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ, you can have confidence in God's grace. I want to just give you confidence. You can have confidence in God's grace. See, whenever God's truth makes demands on you, you know, I just listed a few of them. Be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. These are all quoting scriptures. Make yourself ready. Return to your first love. Overcome apathy, lukewarmness. Overcome Jezebel. Purify your heart. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Deny yourself and take up your cross. Whenever God's truth makes demands on you, God's grace provides you with the power needed to obey these requirements from the heart. That's the beauty of God's grace. The absolute beauty of God's grace is whatever his truth demands, his grace provides power so you can obey him from the heart in thought, motive, and deed. So here's, this brings me to uh, the, you know, we've talked, we've been going through different laws of this or principles of the spirit-led life. This brings me to the sixth law of the spirit-led life, and that's this. This. 
is God's grace empowers you to obey what his truth demands, enabling you to abide in Christ deeper and yield Christ-like fruit in abundance. I'll read that one more time. God's grace empowers you to obey. This is, it should be up here. Oh, we don't. Okay, cool. God's grace empowers you to obey what his truth demands, enabling you to abide in Christ deeper and yield Christ-like fruit in abundance. See, here's the thing about grace. It's so misunderstood. You ask the typical evangelical Christian, what is grace? And almost every single one of them is going to answer, it's the unmerited favor of God that forgives you of your sins and saves you. I mean, growing up in a traditional Baptist church, that is what I was taught week after week after week. God's grace is the unmerited favor of God that forgives you of your sins and saves you. Now, there is obviously truth in that statement. You can look up the, the definitions of charos, which is grace, and you can see, okay, yes, you can see that, that traditional definition, there is, there's truth in that. Grace is unmerited. Grace is God's favor. Grace is God doing something what you don't deserve. Grace is God forgiving you of your sins. Grace is God saving you and justifying you and declaring you righteous. That is all true. That is all God's grace. However, the scriptures go much deeper. Grace is not only just the unmerited favor of God that forgives sins and justifies you and saves you. Grace is power. And I'm going to show you this. I just want us to see this in Scripture just so we understand this because you, listen, if you watch Christian preachers and you watch Christian TV or YouTube or whatever it is you listen to, you're going to hear this over and over and over again. Grace is the unmerited favor of God that saves you and forgives sins. And you can say, yes, but there's more to the story. There's more to the story. There is more to this story. In fact, if we're going to define grace, I really want to know, okay, what did the Lord say about grace? Because what Jesus Christ himself said about grace is the only thing that really matters. I mean, what Jesus says about grace is it, it trumps what any seminary professor, Greek scholar, or Bible teacher says about grace. So what does Jesus say about grace? We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul was experiencing a thorn in his flesh. There's a huge debate about what that thorn is or was. I'm not going to get into that debate, but there was this thorn that was troubling Paul, that was affecting Paul, afflicting Paul. And Paul was saying, Lord, would you deliver me of this thorn? Lord, would you take away this thorn from my flesh? Lord, would you set me free from this thorn? And Jesus responded in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And he goes on to say, for power is perfected in weakness. The Lord Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, who now shines like the brightness of the sun, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, my grace is power. What he says is the truth. So, yes, grace is the unmerited favor of God that forgives sins and justifies you. Yes, that's true, but Jesus himself said there's something deeper to grace that you must understand. Grace is power. Now, grace is not a power necessarily to external signs, wonders, and miracles Grace is an internal working of God through the indwelling Holy Spirit that gives you power to live like Jesus Christ. Power is dunamis in the Greek, and that word means power for ability. Grace gives you power for ability 
so that you can live like Jesus Christ. So that when the world around you is going into chaos, you can have the peace of Jesus Christ. When the world around you is spinning off into depression and anxiety, is you can have the joy of Jesus Christ. When the world around you is going into narcissism and pride, you can have the humility of Jesus Christ and the self-denial of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ. That is the God's grace at work in you. God's grace is power for ability so that you can live the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. You still with me? Okay. Glad you're still with me. Awesome. In Acts 11.23, you don't want to turn there, I'm just going to just read it real quick. In Acts 11.23, Barnabas came to the church of Antioch and quoting the NIV, Barnabas, he saw what the grace of God had done. Grace was an internal working of God that manifested itself outwardly in behavior and Barnabas could look at it and say, that is the grace of God in operation. The inward power of God that worked itself out into obedience, that worked itself out into action, that worked itself out into doing what God wanted them to do, that grace was evident in the fruit that it bore. So you see, grace is more than just unmerited favor. Strong says that, or Thayer says that, that grace, charos, the word for grace in the Greek, charos is the spiritual condition of one governed by the power of divine grace. The spiritual condition of the one empowered or one governed by the power of divine grace. Ephesians, and these are all in the notes if I'm going quick. I'm just going to go through this part pretty quick. But Ephesians 3, 7 and 8, Paul, was say, Paul said that according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me, according to the working of his power, I'm just trying to stress here, we've, much of the evangelical church has missed what God's grace really means. God's grace is power. God's grace is power. And so now with that said, I want to give you what I believe my, I believe the scriptures teach is a good definition of grace after doing a tremendous amount of study, research, looking at lexicons, dictionaries, stuff like that. I'm going to show you my definition of grace from what I believe is, is a, a really good definition, not because I said it, just but from obviously studying what I believe Scripture was teaching, is grace is the unmerited power of God, it can't be earned, that enables you to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, to be who God calls you to be, to do what God calls you to do, operating when you are conscious of your need by giving you new desires and the ability to respond to God's truth from the heart. Okay, that's a rich definition. Okay, there's a lot to it. That's why we're over this week and the next time I teach this, next session we teach, is I'm going to unpack this and explain, okay, Here's what, I'm going to take each one of these phrases and go through it line by line and just unpack it. But just read it one more time. Grace is the unmerited power of God, enabling you to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, to be who God calls you to be, to do what God calls you to do, operating when you're conscious of your need by giving you new desires and the ability to respond to God's truth from the heart. So now let's go through this and just unpack this uh, statement by statement. Let's start with the first one. Grace is unmerited. See, you cannot earn grace. Grace ceases to be grace if you could earn it. If there's anything you can do to earn God's grace, Paul said, it ceases to be grace. Paul said in Romans chapter 4, verse 4, Paul said, now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. In other words, if you're working so God will favor you, if you're trying to obey him so he will bless you, if you're trying to do all these things for God, then that's not really grace working. That is, the payment for that 
there's a, there's a payment for that, and it's not grace. You see what I'm saying? Grace is free. Grace cannot be achieved. Grace can only be received. See, the moment you think by, by studying the Bible deeper, obviously I'm in favor of studying the Bible. It's what I do for a living. Praying, fasting, witnessing, whatever it is, doing things for God. If you think these things are how you get God to give you grace, then you're still trying to get grace by achieving instead of by receiving. Those things don't uh, allow you to get grace. They position you to receive grace. You see the difference? The moment you think, I need to do these things so God will bless me, I need to do these things to receive God's grace, like reading the Bible, praying, fasting, so God will give me grace. See, God does not give grace based on that. Those things position you to receive grace. You see what I'm saying? See the difference there. Grace cannot be received. Grace or grace cannot be achieved, only received. See, we've got to understand this about God's grace. God's grace is absolutely free of merit or obedience. See, God gives you grace to obey, not because you have done a certain amount of good stuff for God, then we've earned God's grace. God gives you grace because he's good and he loves you and he wants you to be who God's called you to be. So don't hear from this, oh, I don't need to read the Bible or I don't need to pray or I don't need to fast or I don't need to give or I don't need to witness. No, that is not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is those things position you to receive grace. They don't work so you achieve grace. Does that make sense? So just don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Grace is when God does something for you or in you that's based solely upon his goodness and kindness. The moment you think, I can achieve grace by teeth-gritting obedience, or I can achieve grace by lengthy prayer, then grace has ceased to be grace. See, what I'm saying is, Grace is God giving you his power, not based on what you do, but based on faith. Instead of working harder, we need to believe better. God's grace comes to us by faith. If we want more of God's grace at work in us, more of that power at work in us, we've got to understand that we cannot earn grace. We can only receive grace. And we receive grace by faith. Faith and grace work hand in hand. How were you born again? By grace through faith. How do you walk by his life? By grace through faith. Faith is that password that accesses the grace of God. Faith is how you receive God's power for ability to work in you so that you can be who God calls you to be and do what God calls you to do. Faith in what Jesus Christ has already done for you on the cross. Faith in what the Holy Spirit has already done inside of your human spirit when you were born again. When your human spirit was regenerated, just meditating on what the Holy Spirit did inside of you. He gave you a new righteous spirit. He gave you a new heart. He gave you uh, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Your spirit is now one spirit with him. You are now a partaker of the divine nature. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are now one. That meditating on that and agreeing with that and allowing faith to come into agreement with what God's word says about you is how the channel opens for grace to flow into your life so you can do what God's called you to do. If you don't believe what God has said, if you don't believe what he's done, and if you don't believe what he's done inside of you, grace is hindered from flowing because you, it only operates by faith. Again, the second part of this definition is grace and is power. I know we've talked about this, so I won't, I won't linger on this very long. But in, let's, let's turn in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to see this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. The more and more we can see in Scripture, 
about what, what Scripture says about grace, the more and more we can renew our mind and come into alignment with God's definition of grace, the more we can see God's grace at work in our lives. 2 Timothy 2.1, Paul said to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. So what does grace do? Grace gives you strength. What does grace do? Grace gives you power. What does grace do? Grace gives you the enabling ability to do whatever God has called you to do and to be whoever God has called you to be. Grace is divine empowerment for transformation. If you feel as if you cannot be transformed, if you feel as if you're just continually on this treadmill going nowhere, the issue is you have not yet tapped into the life-changing, transforming power of God's grace, and you receive that by faith. Paul said, you don't have to turn here, but Paul said in Colossians 2.6 that as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. Well, how did you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? By grace, through faith. How do you walk in that life, that new life? By grace, through faith. The same way you were born again is the same way you are to live after you're born again. By grace, through through faith, by grace, through faith. That is the Christian life, right there, by grace, through faith. You think about this. Just think about what God did when he saved you. God gave you the power to do what you could never do. God gave you the power to have a new spirit that is righteous. God gave you the power to have a spirit that is Christ-like, holy, you have been raised up with Jesus Christ. You have been seated with, in heavenly places with him. All of that God did. You had no role. All you said is yes to the finished work of the cross. All you said is yes to Jesus Christ. And God did all of that when you were born again. Now, you might, it might take you years and years and decades to walk that out, but God did that in a moment when you said yes and put your faith in him. Now, if God did that when you were saved, how much more does God want to do that at, by living by his life, by grace through faith. That's the power of God to live a victorious, overcoming Christian life. The next thing I want to unpack here is grace enables you to overcome. There's a lot of bad teaching out there about the grace of God. Some have called it hyper-grace that basically says you can live however you want to live. But contrary to popular teaching today, grace doesn't cover or excuse sin. Grace gives you the power to overcome sin. If you ever hear any teaching in the name of grace that you feel enabled to go off and sin without consequences, you've not heard biblical grace. Grace does not cover sin. Grace empowers you to overcome sin. And so this hyper-grace teaching out there that basically says you can live like the world with no consequences is a doctrine of devils. It has no root in the scriptures, no biblical basis. God's grace empowers you to overcome sin. Grace is the power of God that transforms you internally. And as you are transformed internally, you can then live like Christ lived. Now, let's, let's turn to uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Paul wrote and he said, for the grace of God has appeared. Jesus Christ not only gives you grace, Jesus Christ is grace. Jesus Christ not only gives you truth, Jesus Christ is truth. Ultimately, grace is a person. 
and his name is Jesus. Grace is a person and his name is Jesus. The grace of God has appeared. Jesus Christ has appeared and he's brought salvation to all men. Notice what the grace of God at work does. It instructs us not to compromise with the world, but to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. What a complete contrast to the message of grace that is going out, that's, that's giving people the liberty to sin without consequences. That is not biblical grace. That word instruct here in Titus where it says the grace of God instructs us to deny ungodliness, that word instruct literally means to train children. And you know in, in the eternal blueprint book I wrote about God's eternal purpose when I, 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 I wrote about the, the child training that an immature child goes through as that child is, grew, is groomed and raised up to be that son in whom he is going to be placed in the, into the father's inheritance. As that child goes through that child training where that, the, the child is driven out of that child is rebellion and lawlessness and immaturity. Driven out of that child is selfishness and pride and saying and immaturity and saying I can do it my own way. That's really the same word. That is the same process that, that Paul is describing here in Titus is the grace of God is your child trainer. So grace is trains you and instructs you to move from an immature child into, to a fully mature Christ-like son that can be placed into the inheritance of Jesus Christ. Grace is what it, grace trains you. Grace disciplines you. Grace is what raises you up into maturity. Grace does not give you that covering for sin or an excuse for sin. Hebrews 10.29 said, says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. The indwelling Holy Spirit in whom you are one spirit with, he is called the spirit of grace. Isn't that beautiful? You have the spirit of grace joined to your human spirit when you're born again. You have the spirit of grace grafted to your human spirit when you're born again. You have this pipeline that doesn't have to be blocked or hindered, that you can receive grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. You can receive that kind of grace because your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, and he is the spirit of grace. The indwelling spirit is the spirit of grace. You have access 24-7, any time, any day, to go in to your spirit and access the grace of God for power to live the Christ-like life. So why aren't you doing it? Why aren't I doing it? We're living far below what we could be living. We're billionaires, but we're living in poverty. We have the grace without limitation inside of us to live the Christ life, to be like Christ, to be conformed into his image, to live as he lived, to live and walk as he walked, yet we're not tapping into that grace. But we have that access if we only believe. See, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, which we talk about a lot of this church, where Jesus exhorted us, overcome losing your first love, overcome false teaching, overcome Jezebel, overcome apathy and indifference, overcome lukewarmness, overcome false doctrine, overcome all these things. The, the, the challenge of the Lord to say that in the face of persecution, in the face of challenge, don't bow down, stay faithful and loyal unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Overcome the lukewarmness that has just not even crept, that is the, the stronghold of the American church, where we are just lukewarm and apathetic towards God. It's like we don't really care, we're indifferent. That is a stronghold in the American church. To overcome that. How do we overcome it? By the grace 
of God in us. The spirit of grace flowing out of us, giving us power, giving us ability, enabling us to overcome, enabling us to live like he lived and to walk like he walked. Just as we bring this one point to a close, sorry, some are like, oh, all right, he said we're bringing not the message, this one point to a close. If you ever hear any teaching about God's grace that gives you liberty to compromise, that gives you liberty to flirt with the world, to live selfishly in the name of grace, I'm telling you that's not biblical grace. Grace gives you the power to live an overcoming life. Grace gives you the power to deny sin and overcome sin. Next point. Is grace empowers you to be who God's called you to be. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. He says, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. See, we live in a culture that is driven by success. It's an idol in our culture, success. How big are you? How much have you done? How much money do you have? How much influence do you have? How many, how many people do you, follow you on social media? How many people are following you on YouTube? How many people are you influencing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We live in this, this, this success-driven culture in America. You know, if you talk to people from other nations, they're like, you guys in America do everything big. It's like we, would, we have a hardware. I remember writing, I forget where we were, talking to someone from England. It's like, you know, we have a, like a hardware store, but you have this like massive warehouse called Home Depot. And you don't just have Home Depot, you also have Lowe's. It's like what you, everything you guys do in America is big. It has to be big. It's like you have these buffets, Endless buffets of food after food after food. Just like everything you do in America has to be big, 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 big is better. And so we tend to think we bring that into our Christian experience and we think, okay, what I do is more important than who I am. And we bring that into our Christianity when that, the, the scriptures actually say the opposite. What God is more interested in is not what you do for him. Now, doing things, doing things in partnership with him is important. But even more important than what you do for God or with God is who you become to him. God's eternal plan and purpose is to conform you into the image of his son. There is nothing greater than that. To be conformed into the image of his son. What God wants you to be, who, what you do in Christianity should flow out of who you are. If you have a very limited measure of Jesus Christ formed in you, then what you're going to do for God is not going to be very valuable to him. Only Christ is valuable to God. Christ in you, Christ working in you, Christ working through you, Christ working to produce fruit in you out of the abiding life, that's what pleases God. Not us going and doing things for God in the power of the soul, hoping that God would bless us. Who you become is more important than what you do, though what you do is very important. Who you become to God is of utmost importance. And grace is what gives you the power to be who God's called you to be. Grace is the power to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Grace is the power to be a worthy bride for his son. Grace is the power to be a mature son who can handle the inheritance of Jesus Christ. Grace is the power to be that temple that is possessed by the Holy Spirit, to be that body that is possessed by the Holy Spirit. 
Grace is the power that gives you that ability to be who God has called you to be. Now let's turn to Ephesians, or actually Acts chapter 20, verse 32. I want you to see this. God has called us to be a bride made ready. Acts 20, verse 32. God has called us to be a bride made ready. God has called us to be a mature son of God. God has called us to be Christ-like. God has called us to live a Sermon on the Mount lifestyle. God has called us to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now notice what Acts 20, verse 32 says. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace... Now, notice what the Word of God's grace will do. The Word of God's grace is able, why? Because God's grace has power inherent in it. God's grace is able to build you up. And God's grace is able to give you the inheritance, the inheritance of Christ, the mature son, the overcoming son. The Psalms 2, Messianic inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Sanctification is necessary for inheritance. And grace is how you become sanctified. Grace is how you inherit. God's grace has the power and the ability so that you can be sanctified and you can inherit. See, we, I talked about in the eternal blueprint is that, is that God's eternal rewards, and I've, I got the language from Dad a long time ago, but the eternal intimacy, eternal authority, and eternal glory, those eternal rewards, Jesus listed in Revelation 2 and 3, those eternal rewards that he offers us is not the automatic birthright of every believer. I'm writing a book about this, and You know, just studying that it's like, oh, man, this is challenging. This is convicting. This is not the automatic birthright of every born-again justified believer. It's given to those believers, like I just read, who experience sanctification, who experience Christ-likeness, who experience holiness, who have become conformed into the image of God and the image of Jesus Christ by the grace of God. See, in Revelation 21, 7, those who overcome will inherit all these things. It's overcoming by God's grace that we enables us to inherit. What God is calling us to, I just want you to just drill this in, is humanly impossible. Now, that does not mean I'm quitting, I'm not going to try. No, there is a synergy in God's grace. There is a working together in God's grace that you must partner with him in grace so that you don't receive the grace of God in vain. But what I'm saying to you is is the standard to which God is calling us to, to be conformed into the image and the likeness of the Lamb of God, to be like Christ in heart, motive, and deed, to overcome and live the overcoming life. That is which God calls us to is humanly impossible. But on the other hand, if you ever hear a truth which makes you feel as if you cannot attain it, you've only heard half the truth. Because resident within that truth is the power of God that will enable you to be who God calls you to be. God's power, when he gives you truth, enables you to become, by the Spirit of the Lord at work in you, who God calls you to be. Be confident. Be confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I just want to give you confidence in God's grace. I don't care what your past is. I don't care if your life is a mess. I don't care if you've had so many issues and strongholds all kinds of rejection and abuse. It, it, to, to God can handle all of that. What God can't handle is unbelief. That's why I'm saying be confident in the grace of God. Be confident in his power inside of you 
to be who he's called you to be. He's called you to be his lamb, a lamb-like bride to his son, without spot, without stain, without wrinkle. God is able to do that inside of you. He absolutely is able. To live the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle. Have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount and seen the challenge in that? I mean, the pure in heart, see God. I mean, raise your hand if you have a pure heart. Because if you do, I'll just automatically say you don't have a pure heart because you're proud about it. (laughs) The pure in heart, I was kidding, but the pure in heart will see God. That's not easy. I mean, probably none of us right now have a pure heart. Some of us, like my wife, have more of a pure heart than me and others, but we're a work in progress. We're a work in progress. But the requirement never goes down. The requirement never goes away. The meek will inherit the earth. I mean, how good is your meekness? I mean, how much do you immediately comply with the Holy Spirit when it goes against your will? When the Holy Spirit says, I want you to do something, and you don't particularly like what he's suggesting, how compliant with you are you, with him are you? How meek are you? How much resistance do you put up? The meek inherit the earth. What about judging and criticizing? Goodness, don't we all so so quickly to judge and criticize? And I'm not talking about some people go the other way and say, well, you should never call out sin. That's judging. That's not what the Lord's talking about. He's talking about with a critical spirit, without love. How, How much have you overcome that critical spirit, that judgmental spirit? Not judging someone else until you look internally into your own heart and say, okay, Lord, I need work here. See, that kind of lifestyle, walking the narrow path, not doing anything to be praised by men, not praying to be noticed, not giving to be noticed, not doing your outward righteousness so the people go, hey, great job, Brian, that was awesome. Not doing any of that for those reasons. The only way we can live that kind of life is by the grace of God, to be who God has called us to be. Still there? Next thing I want to say, and this will bring us to a close, is grace enables spiritual alignment. Here's what I mean by that. Is I was talking about that during the baptism, is when we are baptized, when we become born again, we're born again, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. And when we are baptized into the body of Christ, through that union we have with the Holy Spirit, everything that's true about Jesus Christ is true about us in him. We have then become crucified. We have then become crucified with him. We have then become, we have then died with him. We have then died in him. And then we have also been resurrected in him. We are We are the righteousness of God in him. We are sanctified in him. He is wisdom in us. Christ, everything that Christ is, everything that Christ is when we are in him is imputed to us and reckoned to be true about us. You are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are now far above all rule and power. Now, all those things are true in our legal position in Jesus Christ, but we have this reality called our living, our living condition, and there's a gap between our legal position in Christ and our, our living condition in Christ, that God wants to close that gap so that no longer would we just be 
uh, imputed righteousness, but we would live and we would walk in the righteousness of God. That no longer would we just be positionally crucified with Jesus Christ, but the cross would work experientially within us to put self-life to death. No longer would we just be in Christ sanctified, but sanctification would have a real experience in our heart, in our soul, in our thinking, in our emotions, in our body, and how we live. We would have that sanctification worked out within inside of us. What I want to say is that grace is what closes the gap Grace is what brings spiritual alignment. Grace is what closes that gap so that who you are in your legal position and who you are in your living condition are are one that God has closed that gap. That's the power of grace. God wants to close that power or God wants to close that gap. So that you can no longer just that you would no longer have to say I am the righteousness of God in him, though powerful you would be able to say, I am like him in nature. I am like him in character. I am like him in fruit. I am like him. Uh, God has done a work in me of forming Christ in me, and now I am not just righteous in position. I'm righteous in condition. The spirit of the living God has formed Christ within me, and now when God looks at me, he sees Christ and the fact that I've been formed into the image of Jesus Christ, that I have his meekness, I have his humility, I have his love, I have his peace, I have his patience, I have his servant's heart, I have his empathy, I have his compassion, I have all that is of Christ has now been worked and formed in me by the Holy Spirit by the power of God's amazing grace. Grace is so awesome. Grace is so powerful. As we bring this to a close, just, I just want you to walk away with this. I can be confident in the grace of God to change me and to transform me. I can be confident that he who began a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. and we'll... Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. I just ask you, Lord, that you would just do a work within us right now. Do a work in our hearts right now, Lord where we would believe. Lord, your grace is amazing and your grace can change us. If we struggle with bitterness, if we struggle with unforgiveness, your grace can give us the power to forgive. Your grace can give us the power to overcome. If we struggle, if we've been rejected, if we've been abused, your grace gives us the power to overcome the abuse or the rejection. Lord, if we struggle with pride or selfishness, your grace gives us the power to overcome those things. Lord, that you would just give us a vision and a confidence, Lord, that he who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, that we would have confidence, I pray, in the grace of God to transform us internally in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's, we'll end the online portion here. God bless you.